Hey guys, Wes here from Productive Dev. I'd like to welcome you to the brand new Angular 4 and .NET Core 2.0 web API course in which we'll be building a front-end business intelligence dashboard with Angular 4, as well as building out a web API using .NET Core 2.0. So I think this course will be a lot of fun. It's sort of geared to uh, beginner to intermediate level Angular 4 and .NET Core users. So if you haven't used either of these technologies before, um, then we're definitely gonna go slow enough that you should be able to follow along. Hopefully this is the type of application that you could customize for your own, uh, your own use, really for any sort of backend API. I've also tried to design this course so that it should work multi-platform, meaning that if you're on Windows or Mac or Linux, you should be able to follow along without much trouble. So yeah, thanks for purchasing the course. As with the other courses at Productive Dev, as I find improvements to make or bug fixes, I'll update the course with those fixes and then uh, send you a message if you've purchased the course, just to keep you aware of any updates that I make to these courses. All right, thanks again for taking the course and good luck on your journey. I'm really looking forward to building this course with you. See you around. Okay, so here's a look at the application we'll be building over this course. So we have a sort of business intelligence type dashboard here where we have a backend API that our Angular application is actually querying or you know, sending requests to, and the API is returning us results from our database. So this is all live data. It's currently hosted on a local Postgres database. So we'll look at how to implement all of that. And yeah, so this first page here is a sales volume page. And so this is just a demonstration of how you might implement some data visualization using the chart.js library with Angular. So I have three different types of charts here. We have a bar chart, and then this is a donut chart or a pie chart, and then a line chart here. And chart.js does a really nice job both um, with the visualization aspect and being able to customize the way that your charts look, um, but also functionally. So you can see that as I hover over any number of my data points or data series, I get this sort of popover with some additional data. So that's kind of nice. Um, it also has a few other minor features like the ability to hide or show data. Um, if I click on the data series here on the line chart, for instance, or in one of the, the donut charts here. So I think this looks pretty good and it's definitely going to be quite easy to change out the chart type here. Um, so we'll look at a number of different types of charts and then you could definitely customize the type of charts and the type of data that you're displaying on this page. Okay, so the next page that we'll look at will be the latest orders page. And what we have here is a demonstration of how to do some pagination for data. So you can see here that I'm displaying 10 records out of a, out of a thousand records on 100 pages. And we have this sort of pagination component here, which will allow us to cycle through the orders that are in our system. And so we'll have an order table in our database that the Angular app will actually, you know, implement our backend API to query. And so we can only return 10 results at a time rather than, you know, querying for all 1000 results and having them all um, on the front end. So at any given time, we're only dealing with 10 records. And then each time we paginate this component, we are sending another query back to our database to retrieve another set of 10 orders. So we'll look at that. We'll also look at, you can see here in the status column here, we have a tag that says either fulfilled or waiting. And so if an order has an order complete date, then we'll look at how to, you know, signify that here on the front end with one of these two tags. And that's something else, of course, you could customize to suit your particular needs. Okay, and finally, we have a third page in this application, which I'm calling system health. And so what we have here is sort of a mock representation of maybe different types of servers that you would have at your organization. So we have three different environments. So we've got dev, QA, and prod, for example. And each of those environments have three different servers. So we'll have like a web server, an analysis server, and a mail server. So these server objects are actually just represented, you know, in our database as, you know, one of our entity types, if you will. 
And the purpose of this page is to give the front end user, you know, a picture of whether or not that particular server is online or offline. Of course, you could customize this to have other properties on your object as well. But in this case, um, this just gives us a high level view of whether or not that server is on or off. And we can then send a message back to our server to either turn it on or shut it off. So what's happening here is that I'm actually going to be sending a put or a patch request to this particular server object and changing its status from offline to online. And all that is happening asynchronously here. The other thing that's kind of nice is if we open this up in another session, we can see that this is live, if you will. So if I change um, the status of the servers here on the left, then it's updated in the session on the right as well. So we don't need to actually refresh the page in order for the, the front end to be refreshed, even in a separate session. Okay, and finally, the, the overall design of this dashboard is really suited for you know being displayed on a full screen somewhere. So if we hit F11, we get something that might look nice if it was on you know, a monitor that was hanging on the wall or something that perhaps either a DevOps or a development team or even a business team would find useful. So it was definitely a lot of fun to put together the front end of this application um, and kind of try to make it nice and appealing. We'll look at some other things also, like how to create uh, custom themes for the application. And yeah, with the goal of both looking at, in general, how to build an application like this, but also making it flexible enough so that you could customize it for your own needs. Okay, and the other part of this course will actually be the backend API itself. So I'm gonna open up a new tab here. So the API itself is actually running on another port here locally. And I've got a Chrome plugin here, which is formatting the JSON response that we're getting back from the API. So I'll have this customer route. And in this case, what it's going to do is show me two customers on one page. I could do the same for orders. So let's say we want to see one page of 20 orders. And yeah, so this is the type of response we're getting back from our database pretty standard uh, web API. One of the neat things about this project is that I'll show you how to actually um, create some mock data to populate your database. So for instance, um, I've got a thousand orders in this database and it was generated really with just a few lines of code. And so we'll look at how to do that in .NET Core 2.0 and this data is actually hosted on a Postgres database that is also running locally. So we'll look at how to set up Postgres and get that wired up to our .NET Core application. It'll also be really straightforward to set this up either with a SQL Server database, if you're running like SQL Express locally or a MySQL database. .NET Core makes it pretty easy to change out the backend that you're implementing without really having to change much about the rest of your code. I also think that any framework in general is a really nice ORM to uh, deal and manage with your data in an MVC app. Okay, so that was probably a lot all at once, especially if this is your first time building an Angular application or a web API, um, but I promise that we'll go uh, you know, at, an, at a good pace and we're gonna cover a lot, but we'll also um, you know, keep in mind as we go sort of like the, the high level view and the goal that we have here of ultimately providing something uh, useful to an end customer or for yourself. So we'll start out with you know how to get set up, how to get your development environment um, set up to develop both for Angular 4 and for .NET Core 2.0. We'll get our Postgres SQL database set up and then you know we'll just take it one step at a time, start building out our components and start building out the web API. So I think this should be a lot of fun and yeah, hopefully we build something useful. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, in this video, I'd like to quickly cover some of the prerequisites um, that you should have installed on your system. I've done my best to make this course cross-platform um, by using tools that are available regardless of the operating system that you're using. I'll be developing on Windows in this course but as I mentioned, you should be able to follow along quite well um, if you're on Mac or Linux as well. So the first thing that we'll need to install is Node.js. So this is our JavaScript runtime. If you've worked in Angular before, then you'll certainly be familiar and have Node on your machine already. 
But if not, just head over to nodejs.org and download it for your operating system. When you install Node, it will also come with a package manager called NPM. So NPM is a package manager for JavaScript. It's really easy to use and it's going to be what we use to install the various JavaScript packages that we'll use throughout the course. Next, go ahead and install TypeScript. So you can head over to typescriptlang.org and you can see how to install that with NPM. It should just be npm install g TypeScript. This will install globally on your system. We'll be using TypeScript with Angular. And again, if you're not familiar with Angular yet, and this is your first time building an application in Angular, then in short, TypeScript allows us to type our JavaScript and it ultimately gets compiled down into JavaScript, but it makes coding applications in frameworks like Angular a really pleasant experience by providing us with the ability to type some of our code. Okay, so once that's installed, go ahead and install the Angular CLI. This is, as you can see, the command line interface for Angular. The CLI is simply going to provide us with tools to scaffold out our Angular application, making it very easy to get up and going very quickly. It also provides tools to generate components and services and any of the other parts of our application that we need to build we can use the, the CLI tool to generate those various parts of our application. And it comes with um, a built-in functionality to spin up a development server so that we can test our app locally while we're developing. So go ahead and install the Angular CLI. Next, you just need to have some type of text editor of your choice to work in through this course, whether it's Atom or Vim or Sublime Text or any other editor of your choice. In this particular course, I'll be using Visual Studio Code, which is a cross-platform. It's definitely been working out quite well for me in uh, building a few other Angular projects and we'll build both. And I'll be using it to build out both the Angular application, so our front-end application in this course, as well as the back-end application, our .NET Core 2.0 web API project. So if you'd like to follow along directly, then I would recommend using Visual Studio Code. Otherwise, use a, a particular editor that you're more comfortable with. I will simply be using command line arguments for installing all the various packages and setting things up both on the .NET side of things as well as on the Angular side of things. So we won't be relying on anything that a particular IDE will be providing us. Okay, so now we'll need to also install .NET Core. So if you can scroll down here, you should see the .NET Core installers for Windows. These are also available, again, cross-platform um, for Linux or Mac OS as well. I'll be using .NET Core 2.0, so just make sure that you install um, .NET Core 2.0 for this course. Okay, for the database for this course, I've chosen to use PostgreSQL. It will also be quite straightforward to implement any other type of database with the .NET Core 2.0 web API that we'll be building. But again, if you'd like to follow along directly, then I'll be using the PostgreSQL database. This will also provide a front-end application called pgadmin, and that's very similar to other front-ends for other database management systems like SQL Server Management Studio. That will basically allow us to set up users and query our tables um, relatively easily through the provided GUI. So go ahead and get the Postgres database server installed as well as PG admin. Then if you're interested in a console emulator, if you're on a Windows machine, um, what I'm developing on Windows, typically I'm using this Commander Terminal Emulator. It comes with Git for Windows, which will provide us with the Unix commands, which I prefer to use, as well as some additional styling to our terminal. All in all, it's a really good terminal emulator if you're working on Windows and a nice alternative to the Windows Command Prompt or PowerShell. That said, regardless of the terminal you're using, I'll also be using Git for version control throughout this course. We won't be doing anything elaborate with Git. I'll basically just be using it to make commits as I work through the code, and I'll be pushing it up to a remote repository. If you'd like feedback on the course while you're building it and you'd like to get in touch, it's much easier for me and others to debug your code if you are pushing it to a remote repository like GitHub. So I definitely recommend that if you're working through the course. Okay, with those dependencies set up on your system, we should be ready to roll. 
Okay, so welcome back. In this video, we're gonna take a look at how to set up a GitHub repository for your application if you'd like to do that and haven't ever set up a GitHub repo before. So just go ahead and sign up for an account at github.com. You should be able to get a free account. Um, I believe you can get a paid account if you would like to use private repositories. Um, so what we're, what we're gonna do is create a new repository to store our code for this course in. So if you visit your GitHub page and then select repositories and then select new, you can very easily create a new repository. So we're gonna call this ng site. And for description, I'm just gonna call this uh, business intelligence dashboard built with Angular 4. And I'm gonna make this private but feel free to make this uh, public as you work on the project. This will also um, allow others to help you with the project if you run into um, certain problems or bugs and you'd like to troubleshoot it together with someone. Um, if you make the repository public, then that person obviously will have access to your code. I won't worry about initializing the repo with the readme because we already have one in our project. So I'll just select create repository. Okay, so we only really need to push the repo that the CLI has already created for us um, to GitHub. And so we need to add this repo here hosted on GitHub as a remote. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy this. And we'll head back to the command line here and make sure you're in the uh, root directory of the project that you just created. And now I'll just go ahead and paste and then just run this command. And now we can git push and then to set upstream we do dash u origin, and then the branch, which is master. Okay, so now you can see that the branch has been set up to track the remote branch from origin, and if we revisit our uh, repo and refresh the page, we can see that our application now has an active GitHub repo. You can also now read the markdown file that the Angular CLI created for us as well. So that's all there is to setting up a GitHub repo for your project. Again, I would recommend doing this. Um, first of all, it's good to learn how to use GitHub if you haven't set up a repo before. And if your repository is public, that provides you with an even easier way to interact with others who are working on the application, perhaps with you or on their own. So, so yeah, I'll be using this repo throughout the course. And so you'll also be able to see all of my individual commits, which would also provide kind of a nice history um, to parallel along with the videos themselves.